Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. This one, oh, we're diving into the conspiracy theories today because we're talking about the World Economic Forum. Is that Davos? Davos? Is that it? Where all those super important people go and like talk about and add an 80 some Illuminati, maybe ritual, sacrifice some children, that kind of stuff. Obviously all real. Let's jump in. Welcome to, oh, thank you, George, for putting together today's episode of the one of the show. If you're new, I've never read this before. We're going to read it together and explore, dear audience. Welcome to 2030. I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. If you strayed, oh, it's a quote. Sounds like it's from like 1984 or some shit. Which, obviously, it wouldn't be because then it would be called 2030, wouldn't it? If you've strayed onto the political side of the internet at all in the last few years, I, know, I try not to, you've likely already come across this rather ominous phrase. Oh my god, I totally haven't. It was first started by Ida Auken, a Danish politician and member of the World Economic Forum, or WAF, specifically its Young Global Leaders Arm, all the way back in November 2016, and since then, to some, it has come to serve as a synopsis of everything that is foul and wicked about that organization. One that they- What goes on in Davos if it's not this? What is Davos? And don't tell me it's like a, mount, uh, a resort in Switzerland. That's not what I'm after. It is the World Economic Forum, and it is also a town in Switzerland. Woo! Look, and I mean, this sound, it's supposed to sound ominous, right? I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. It's like, yo, if the person, if life has never been better, then that's fine. Like, you don't want to own anything? Fine. You don't want to have any privacy? Fine. If that's because life is, uh, and that makes life awesome? Great! Like, I have no problem with that. <laughs> like, do I like owning Yes. Do I like privacy? Yes. Do uh, Is life good? Yes. But maybe life would be better if I gave away everything and just lived in a glass box. <laughs> be miserable. <laughs> oh god, they're right. They're right. I take it all back. Just before we continue with today's episode, I've got something special to share with you. Look, now, I'm not much of a skincare enthusiast, honestly. <laughs> skincare. Kind of a hassle. Uh, but that is where Foreo, today's sponsor, come in. Look, have you ever felt that your skin needs a bit more hydration? I, I am. Like, I have dry skin. Like, I'll just randomly get dry skin on my face, on my hands. I don't even know. It could be summer. I mean, it happens more often in winter. But it could be like any time you're just be like, oh, dry skin, huh? <laughs> I don't know why, but look, that's where the UFO3 comes in. This deep facial hydration device can boost your skin's moisture levels by up to 126% in just two minutes. It's also got a warming feature, which is fantastic for the colder months, but even now, it helps the ingredients absorb deeply into your skin and also reduces wrinkles, which is nice because I am getting dangerously close to middle age. Plus, they've got an app, the Foreo app. It guides you through customized treatments. It's super easy to use, and if you're thinking about a perfect gift, whether be yourself or someone special i uh, got one of these for my wife i got her another foreo thing. i actually got her a couple of foreo three have i got her three foreo things i think so and uh she loves them all as well just as much as me so don't miss out on a 30 percent discount using the link below and if you want to get an extra 10 percent off oh yes use the code dtu10 but that is for the first 50 people only thank you to foreo for sponsoring and now back to today's episode one they view to be akin to a malevolent Lovecraftian monster that spreads its tentacles into every corner of global governance and poisons the wells of liberty and prosperity as it slowly takes control of every part of our lives. Many are quick to dismiss such claims, however, believing them to be little more than reality-separated rantings befitting of a certain famous tinfoil hat-clad info warrior, and certainly you can see why many would dismiss it so. I mean, a global organization that subverts our institutions and takes command of our way of life. It's a preposterous notion, right? Up there with the Illuminati and the Freemasons as a conspiracy theory. I mean, sure, but also it would be awesome. Like, if you were the one who ran this and you were like manipulating world governments and so you could see why people would want to do that. I understand why this is a conspiracy theory because it's like, yeah, it'd be awesome. Like, if you're like, I don't know, some billionaire and you're like, all I gotta do is like get together a few of my bros and we'll like influence policy like to favor us and make us more billions you'd obviously be like yeah okay <laughs> we can do that and yet what if i was to tell you that there just might well be something to this one curious well worry not because if that declaration most bold has left you ravenous to know more all you must do is not touch that dial for the next 90 minutes or so and we shall get to the bottom of it together so let's begin what even is the wef 
Now, before we get into the really juicy stuff, i.e. the conspiratorial aspect of the WEF, let's take time to cover the basics and get a nice foundational understanding of what the WEF even is. After all, understanding what something actually is is kind of important when one wants to muse upon its impact, actions, and influence. A mate of mine who's into politics, he's like, yeah, yeah, it's like one of his life goals is literally getting invited to the World Economic Forum in Davos. He's like, yeah, yeah, no, that's like one of my goals. <laughs> I want to go there. Hopnob with the Illuminati. I had hoped that getting such an understanding would be a nice and short affair, one in which I would get in double fast, slap down a big fat copy and pasted mission statement or two, then get out just as quick, so that we could orientate ourselves toward the potential Bond villainesque global machinations with all warranted haste. But alas, optimistic though I was that we would be able to handle this matter promptly, the fickle hand of fate had other things in mind, as instead it opted to deliver on to me a kick in the ghoulies that was both well-aimed and driven with the strength of Hercules himself. <laughs> the power of this proverbial package punt came from the fact that basically everything the WEF puts out about itself is wrapped up in and obfuscated by layer upon layer of empty, meaningless corporate bollocks. Allow me to demonstrate. Here is what the WEF says they are in their own concise summary. Oh my god, it's like four paragraphs. Four long paragraphs. Let's do it quickly. The World Economic Forum is the international organization for public-private cooperation. It provides a global, impartial, and not-for-profit platform for meaningful connection between stakeholders to establish trust and build initiatives for cooperation and progress. In a world marked by complex challenges, the World Economic Forum engages in political, business, academic, civil society, and other leaders of society to shape global, regional, and industry agendas. Established in 1971 as the Illuminati, nah, just joking, as a not-for-profit foundation, it is independent, impartial, and not tied to any special interests, upholding the highest standards of governance and moral and intellectual integrity oh my god and it goes on but it's just like corporate bull entrepreneurship innovation cooperation different beliefs viewpoints <laughs> facilitating progress unique combinations Ah, it's so cringe and corporate <laughs> My lord. I feel like if I asked ChatGPT to come up with some corporate bollocks to describe nothing, this is what it would come up with. But while that extract may have been slightly less coherent than myself after 15 pints of lager, that Jesus, that doesn't mean it is without utility, because if we take it and run it through the vernacular mangle to squeeze all of the corporate nonsense speak out of it, we learn that WF is a non-profit organization established back in 1971 that aims to improve the world by providing a shared platform slash clubhouse of sorts for people from the business, academic, political, and media spheres to come together and bash out their ideas, and that also it proactively lobbies and tries to actuate outcomes through all of these so-called centers that it has. Now, call me a cynic, folks, but while at face value all of this might sound lovely and altruistic, rich and powerful sorts coming together to ever so vaguely do good, as it were, just from that self-description alone, I think we could be forgiven for donning our trusty tinfoil hats and narrowing our eyes and staring suspiciously towards the WF here, because while doing good at face value is, well, good and all that, it does sound ever so slightly New World ordery, doesn't it? You have to admit that. Yeah, it does. And it's like, do these people really get together just to talk about, you know, like the political leaders and billionaires? And they're just like, what good can we do? How can we save the world? I believe some people are generally or genuinely trying to do that. Like Bill Gates. And of course, these people are also interested in their self-interest. Like, didn't someone describe Elon Musk as like, yeah, Elon Musk wants to save the world as long as he's the one saving it. And it's like, of course, these people have a self-interest, but generally they're doing a lot of good. I know Elon Musk can be a bit cringe. But he kind of did do a lot of like pushing forward electric cars. He does do a lot for pushing forward um, private space flight and stuff like that. Not just for billionaires, but for like actually getting into space that is useful for humanity rather than Jeff Bezos's like rocket ship for billionaires. <laughs> not that if he was like, Simon, do you want to come? I'd be like, yes, Jeff, immediately. Oh my God, I just had a dream that I went to space on a private flight. I'm going to do it someday. Like when it doesn't cost half a million dollars with Richard Branson's rocket ship for billionaires. But that would be undeniably sick and I would love it. If any of you have private spaceships out there, sign me the f up. My wife won't be happy. She'll be like, it's too dangerous. And I'll be like, it's space. I want to go to space. 
Who, for example, sets the agenda in this cabal of elites? Who holds the greatest share of social capital or grasps its levers sufficiently to be able to dictate both what is put on the agenda and what is then agreed upon? Just how much power does this unelected non-profit hold, and is it enough to influence global events and policy? And do the world elites who associate with the WF actually have our best interests at heart, or do they pursue nutty, reality-separated goals? Considering such questions creates a couple of scales in our minds for us to consider when weighing up the WF, the first of which represents its power and its ability to actually influence world events, on one side of which sits the organization as naught but a boys club of sorts, one in which elites gather, talk big about changing the world, huff each other's own farts, blow smoke up each other's asses, and have a grand old circle jerk session over just how clever they all are, all while nothing actually comes out of their talk. And on the other side sits the WF as a full-on Alex Jonesian New World Order type setup that has real power to manipulate the global status quo, choose national leaders and their policy and generally leave global democracy as naught but an illusion, a comforting blanket that keeps us snug, tight, and sleeping soundly of a night as we fall asleep, ignorant to the fact that we actually have no control over our societies. I think, personally, it's probably more boring than people think. Like, is it people just like huffing their own farts and talking about how awesome they are? Yes. Is it like, is there some sort of like conspiracy and like, should we do this? Should we do that? Should we try and influence this? Yes. But I imagine it's mostly fairly mundane. It's just like, yeah, I mean, it'd be good if this person wasn't the leader of this country, right? And people would be like, yeah, bro, it would be. Maybe we can do some like, and there's no CIA going in to assassinate him. It's just like, maybe we could see if we could get some trade tariffs set up or something really dull. Maybe we could increase the export tax by like 2%. That would disincentivize it. It's just probably really boring. The other scale that we need to consider is that of the quality of the WF's agenda, or on one side of which is the WF as a benevolent force for good in the world, perfect and without flaw, and on the other is the WF as a force of utter chaos and destruction, one that would destroy civilization itself and drive us back into the Neolithic dirt. By figuring out where the WF sits on both of these proverbial scales, fusing them together and considering them in parallel, we will end up with <laughs> fusing them together and considering them in parallel, George. It sounds like the exact sort of corporate speak that the world economic forum would come up with <laughs> i don't know if that's on purpose but that is other than the only word you need to get in there is synergy and it would be perfect we will end up with a kind of mental cardesian coordinate graph and on it will sit a well-reasoned fully considered and expansive view of the wf and its impact upon the world so with the framework we were using throughout the rest of the episode now firmly laid out let's get back to the main task at hand of this chapter figuring out what the f WF actually is, and we shall begin by doing so with some history. It was established in 1971, as you already know, by one Dr. Klaus Schwab, who back then was but a humble business professor at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. First called the European Management Forum, its initial purpose was to host a yearly conference in Davos, also in Switzerland, the so-called European Management Symposium. Oh my god, could it, this sounds so boring. This is the sort of stuff like, I don't know, I studied business at university, and then you'd be, you know, looking for internships or jobs, or companies would come and talk about what they do, and European Management Symposium would sound like the sort of thing that you'd have to go to over a long weekend for work and they'd be like oh no it'll be fun and it would just be incredibly boring this is boring i'm bored now like i'm so glad like i'm sure there's people listening to this who live in this world and have to go to european management forums or like i don't know probably even what like midwest management for symposiums or whatever and i'm just so bad that i didn't have to maybe they're fun what do i know maybe they got like an open bar and everyone gets a bit larry i don't know but i'm glad i don't have to do this <laughs> Uh, where business types from across the length and breadth of Schwab's Rolodex would be invited to gather at the Davos Congress Center, join up in a big circle, and play a vernacular game of tennis, one where ever more boring businesses' words were battered across the court instead of little fluffy balls. Think the Glastonbury Festival with pie charts and long-winded speeches taking the place of agreeable music for the middling classes, and you get the idea. Probably had more cocaine, though. I know what the business types are like. Are the business professors like that, though? <laughs> They're probably a bit more staid. This very exciting theme of that first conference, you ask? Well, that would be corporate strategy and structure. Ah, oh, this is giving me hardcore flashbacks to university, where there'd be a book called Corporate Strategy and Structure, and you'd be like, oh my god, why is it so thick? Why is it 70 pounds? Why? Pardon me, folks, if you don't exactly find my underpants sticky from excitement after hearing that. Ah, oh, George, gross. I don't want to think about that. 
all in all, 450 people attended the first conference. No one worth paying any heed to, mind you, just lots of middle level vice executives of printer paper distribution from copy and paste the faceless mega company number five times. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that that could have been my life. Like, if I had, I don't know, actually done something with my education, I could have gone down that path and become, like, if I had got a job offer, like this, you know, you get those weird inflection points in your life. I remember having some, like, interviews at companies that I'd be like, wow, that's, like, not interesting, but, like, good companies to work for, where you're going to get on a good track, you're going to earn pretty decent money, and I'd probably end up as the vice executive president of something really boring. And that's not as glamorous as you think it is. Like, vice executive presidents, probably, there's probably, like, a hundred of them in, like, one branch of an international company it'd be like just a meaningless thing but that would be me in like 20 years and then i'd retire and they'd give me a gold watch and i'd be like sick and that would be my life doesn't sound that bad actually <laughs> it sounds all right it sounds all right like just going in sitting in an office being like mm, pie charts <laughs> The next year was pretty much a carbon copy of 1971. A few hundred businessmen sat around blowing smoke up each other's bottoms, blah blah blah, you get the idea. The year after that, however, i.e. 1973, that is when things started to get interesting because that's when Schwab, in a move that some sources say was aimed at just pulling in a greater breadth of experience and others say was aimed at Schwab spreading his tentacles like a great Machiavelli and an octopus, started inviting politicians to join in with the proverbial business wank off. Yeah, I mean, if I was a politician, and someone invited me to the corporate business management symposium number five i'd be like uh hard pass <laughs> like i get invited it's very boring and i don't go to any of it because it's boring i do get invited to some cool shit as well which i also don't go to because it's usually really far away <laughs> i don't want to get on a plane <laughs> i won't say which interpretation i believe to be correct but i will ask simon to google charles klaus schwab supervillain outlet outfit and really okay 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 george okay Okay. Turn this into a longer episode than it already is, George. All right, all right. Wait, it just gives me a link to George Monbio. Isn't he that Guardian journalist? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Is this him? Why is he dressed like a supervillain? Wait, he actually dresses like a supervillain. Why is he dressing like a... Why would you do this? Is this actually real? Oh, George Monbio on X says, Oh, X, don't do this to me. Oh, wow, I'm logged in, apparently. Yes, I know how this looks, but cl uh, put the picture up on the screen, dear editor, whoever's editing this, please. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, but Klaus, Ch Klaus Schwab, founder of the WF, is not actually presiding over the ritual sacrifice of the firstborn, but receiving an honorary doctorate at Lithuania's Kansas University of Technology. Cornus, sorry, I was like, what the fuck's Lithuania in Kansas? Okay, he looks like a fucking supervillain. <laughs> It really doesn't do his optics any favors when he struts around dressed like a real-life Dr. Evil. As for which politicians attended that year, f*** knows. I spent a good hour diving deep for this information, and even as I went to ever more sketchy websites desperate to find anything I might be able to follow up to get a confirmed name, nothing. Not even the internet's favorite humble water, f water filter salesman Alex Jones had something for me over on Infowars.com. Oh no, you went to Infowars.com? That's unfortunate. I'm going to go to Infowars.com. <laughs> Just got to see what that's like. Infowars.com. It's probably going to be like, this has been restricted by your government. Not really. But Infowars. There's a war on for your mind! Exclamation point. Uh, okay, let's just look at... I'm just going to choose something at random. Here we go. Oh, wait, that's an advert. Um, vaccine injured teacher files first US lawsuit against AstraZeneca claims COVID jab caused permanent disability. Yeah, but it didn't. Yeah, but it didn't. And if, allegedly. And if it did, it's like a one in a million shot. Um, because generally, vaccines be good. I know, controversial. People will be like, people getting off in the comments about that one. Shit, don't watch. <laughs> get vaccinated fortunately however the absence of an answer is actually an answer in and of itself here kind of allow me to explain you see the conspiracy corner of the internet just loves to trawl back through the history of any political figure to see if they even did so much as stop off in davos to enjoy the free sandwiches and then scream aha we got us a globalist if they find them from the absence of such globalist gotchas online then we can probably assume that no one of any real interest attended yeah that's the thing it's not a secret it's just boring almost all the time when it comes to a conspiracy it's not the conspiracy it's the occam's razor most boring answer and that's it with this the reason that there's not a list of people who went is because they were all like low-level nobodies that no one gives a about and are now dead and probably already forgotten that pretty much remained the state of affairs at davos for the next decade or two each year it got a bit bigger a bit 
bit fancier, more and more people you've actually heard of started turning up, and with their ever greater arrival, the gradual metamorphosis of the meeting into a general business slash governance slash leadership hybrid type thing continued. Come 1987, the now clearly changed and refined nature of things warranted a new name, and thus the European Management Forum was renamed the World Economic Forum, and the European Management Symposium became the very originally named World Economic Forum Annual Meeting. Boring. Oh my god, it all sounds so boring. <laughs> I'm quite impressed that George has kept my attention this long. I hope I've kept your attention, dear viewer, and if I haven't, well, you're not here. So, uh, I don't know why I'm not, uh, it's just a completely unnecessary thing to say. Let's carry on. Then, along after that, the gradual snowballing of the meeting's size, scope, and importance hit a critical mass, and it became the place to be seen for the global elite, which then naturally created an even bigger snowballing as even more people wanted in, and so on and so forth. As much as it is my like friend's goal to go to this thing, <laughs> it's one of those things if I was invited to, I'd probably be like, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I just don't have any desire to go and hobnob with these like powerful people. Just don't give a sh Just I just want to be left alone. Think I'm being overdramatic when I say it became the place? Well, let's nip any such thoughts in the bud now by stopping to take a look at the little selection of people who have either attended the annual meeting specifically or built up an association with the WF more generally in recent years. Representing the politicians, we have people like Tony Blair, a name that may not ring a bell to many of you, but will be instantly familiar to our British audience as he's the kind of Marmite guy that people either adore or despise. I mean, there's things I like about Tony Blair, and there's things I don't like him. I wouldn't say he's a Marmite guy. It's like, what do I think of Tony Blair? I, I think he's a brilliant politician. I think he made some pretty poor decisions. Um, and that's it. Yeah, I think he's a pretty brilliant politician. And that's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing. <laughs> Also, I feel Tony Blair's internationally famous, no? Americans, do you know who Tony Blair is? He served as the UK's Prime Minister from 1997 to 2007, and if you love him, he's the man who made a university education attainable for the masses, introduced the nation's first statutory minimum wage, brought peace to Northern Ireland by ending the Troubles, and championed LGBT plus rights. If you hate him, however, he's the man who knowingly invaded Iraq based on a lie, and then killed Dr. David Kelly to cover it up, created the Supreme Court, and then stuffed it with his ideological chums to undermine democracy, and then undermined it further with the creation of a plethora of new regulatory bodies such as Ofcom and the Food Standards Agency, both of which he again stuffed with people who thought in step with him, started a trend of deficit spending that created a public debt so large that even his children's children's children children will be paying it off, made housing unattainable for the working classes, and through the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change created a vast global network of control so large that he's able to exert an almost neo-colonial degree of influence over the developing world. <laughs> I get the feeling I know what side of the argument George falls on here. Um, and it, interestingly, one of the positive things that he brought up, I think, might be a negative. Uh, uh, <laughs> championing an LGBT... No, no, no. The university education thing. Because there's so much push towards university education in the UK that I think is way too much. Do we really need everyone to have, like, a degree when there really shouldn't be a degree for that? There should just be, like, uh, vocational training? I think vocational training is probably better in, for the majority of things. But while his legacy is subjective, something that is objective is his significant contributions to the WF as both a speaker and a thought leader contributing significantly to discussions on global governance, technology, digital infrastructure, and public health systems. Specific examples include articles such as How Can We Ensure the Success of Sustainable Development Goals, a truly riveting read he published in 2015, and a speech he gave in January 2007 in which he discussed world trade, climate change, and issues concerning Africa, expressing a cautious optimism in in those areas. Note, however, that I specifically picked Blair out to highlight because he represents the top end of one's possible involvement with the WF. Not every politician gets that keen into it. Many do, make no mistake, but off the back of Tony, don't make the mistake of assuming that every politician ever pictured in front of a WF banner is, is Schwab's best mate and might have their own parallel network of soft political control like Tony might do. Like we said earlier, many of them just turn up for the free sandwiches and to be seen, as it were. As for industrialists, a good example would be none other than Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, one-time world's richest man and co-founder of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. If you like him, you see him as one of humanity's greatest ever philanthropists who has tired himself out in recent years by using his fortune to make the world a better place in many areas. Yeah, I'm a Bill Gates fan. Like, is Bill Gates a perfect man? Of course not. No one is a perfect person. Does Bill Gates do a load for humanity with the billions and billions of dollars that he's made? 
yes, he does. In the area of health, his foundation has been a huge push for vaccinations, single-handedly all but eradicating polio, which fell from over 7,000 weekly cases in the previous decade to only 12 in 2023. That's not per week, that's in the whole year. And what's more, he also heavily funds Gavi, the vaccine alliance which has immunized nearly 1 billion children to date. Then there are his efforts in education and poverty alleviation, particularly in developing nations, with the foundation funding everything from access to education through the building and running of new schools, in addition to the sponsoring of pre-existing ones, as well as agricultural development programs that help farmers get greater yields from their land, and thus incomes for them and their families. But wait. There's more stuff for the Gates enjoyers still, because through his foundation, Bill Gates also supports the rollout of affordable and sustainable sanitation solutions in the developing world through his project, the Reinvent the Toilet Challenge, which has so far spent 200 million US dollars and counting on developing and rolling out a cheap, cheerful, and capable toilet across the world. A big deal indeed, when an estimated 3.5 billion people are forced to use unsafe sanitation facilities. Me. That's insane. That's half the world uh, uh, don't have good sanitation facilities. Oh my god. I'm so. Uh, we're so privileged. Holy sh. Dude. You never even think about this, dude. Ah. Uh, god damn. As for his other philanthropic endeavors, let's just sum them up double quick, lest we spend the whole podcast choking on Bill's cock. Excuse me, why? Yes. <laughs> He also supports gender equality in women's health, as well as promoting anti-climate change efforts through the sponsoring and supporting of clean energy solutions. On the flip side, if you dislike Gates, he's a man who uses a philanthropic skin suit to further his own wealth, power, and agenda. I mean, no, if he wanted to further his own wealth, he'd still be the richest man in the world, wouldn't he? But he's giving all his money away. He's literally giving it all away when he's dead. Like, what do you want for it? What, like, what? No, he's just giving it away. On the matter of the vaccination drive, for example, some allege that in 2020, Oxford University was planning on releasing its COVID vaccine under an open license so that anyone could manufacture it. But Gates used his influence to convince them to partner with a pharmaceutical company instead, after which they sold the rights to AstraZeneca, who then manufactured it exclusively for a tidy profit. Is that that? That's just some people alleging, though. Show me some proof. Is there any proof whatsoever of that? Happy to look at it if someone has something in the comments that isn't insane. Similar claims are also made regarding his education and farming initiatives, the latter of which, for example, is supposedly a vector for enormous corporations to enter both developed and developing markets, crush small independent family-run farms, and form an ever-tighter monopoly on the agricultural industry. To evidence this claim, people point to the fact that in 2021, he became the single largest private owner of farmland in the US, and then muse on exactly why a tech guy would ju need just so much farmland. I don't know, because he's an investor. Whatever. Is there any proof that he's doing these bad things? I because here it's just george says similar claims some people believe some people say that sounds very not real as for his specific ties to the wef he writes articles such as the machine turning human waste into drinking water from 2015 which does sound a bit live in the pod and eat the bugs as well as directly collaborating with the WEF on many of his initiatives, with examples being Event 201, a pandemic preparedness event from 2019, and thank fuck he does things like this every year, or that really wouldn't be a good look no matter where you stood. And just to make it very clear, I'm not choosing a side on Billy and Big Tone, I just want you to all have an idea of the kind of very influential people who associate with the WEF and the fact that nearly all of them have their controversies and split opinions in various ways. Yeah, it's like for me like george doesn't want to make a decision i'll be like big tony he's just a good politician feel pretty neutral about him bill gates think bill gates does an awful lot of good for humanity easy what's the more controversial opinion there probably bill gates right because he's so much of a bigger deal than tony blair sorry tony also, something to note further, just as we saw with the tonester for politicians, Billy Boy represents the top end of an industrialist's enthusiasm for the WEF. Not everyone is as keen on it as he is. On a further note, as I was researching today's script, I picked up on a single unifying criticism that covers most, if not all, of the people who get attacked for their associations with the WEF. They are perceived by some as rich and out-of-touch meddlers. Yeah, they aren't all rich or very powerful, like politicians and rich people. What's it? What's Davos's airport like? It must be insane. <laughs> like, just a small runway, but like unlimited storage for private jets, right? It's got to be weird. You, you, like, 
if you own a private jet and you just move in like regular circles you're you're the you're the big boy <laughs> And then you go to WF and you're like in your little G4 or whatever and someone rolls up with a G6 and you're like, oh yeah. Oh, there's so many more powerful and rich pe people who are more powerful and rich than me. Whereas the rest of the time you're like feeling gangster as there's a huge variety of specific interpretations within that, but regardless, the core of the criticisms remains the same. X person has far too much money, and rather than just shutting up and living on their yacht, they're meddling with my life and making it worse in the process. Yeah, look, I just want to be, in that statement, pretty much sums it up for me, I'd just rather be the guy living on the yacht. I don't want to go meddling with I just want to quietly live on my yacht and drink cocktails while the boat rocks back and forward and sun beats down on my body. Like, that's what I want. I don't want to go to the Swiss Alps and talk to a bunch of rich people. <laughs> I just want to live on my boat. So, now we know all of that, let's broaden our picture a bit and run through a quick list of other elites who are associated with the WF. This is a critical thing to appreciate because while the ethics and morality of someone's involvement may be a subjective matter, something that is very objective is the absolutely huge amount of them that are involved. This isn't just one or two who make a lot of noise and overinflate perceptions of elite involvement. It's legitimately a crazy amount. Bear in mind too, this isn't a comprehensive list either, as we simply wouldn't have time today for such a thing. There is Big Tone and Billy Gates. Done them. Completed it, mate. Joe Biden, current president of the US. Donald Trump, former president. Barack Obama, former president. George Bush Jr., former president. Bill Clinton, former president. Ronald Reagan, former president, although I was only able to find evidence of him attending at a distance via phone-in. These are ridiculously famous and powerful people. That for reference is every US president without a gap from the last 31 years. I could find no evidence of George Bush Sr. having any associations, so it would appear that the WF started becoming in vogue as an institution amongst US leadership in the mid to late 80s, at some point seeing as how he skirted it. And that is just the presidents. If we go into the deeper layers of US political establishment, we find people such as Kamala Harris, current VP, Al Gore, Vice President under Bill Clinton, Dick Cheney, Vice President under Bush Jr., John Kerry, Secretary of State, Janet Yellen, Secretary of Treasury, Chris Coons, Patrick Leahy, Bob Menendez, Joe Manchin, current Democrat senators. Uh-oh, we're getting to people I've never heard of. Mike Rounds, Mitt Romney, heard of him. Deb Fisher and Roger Wicker, current Republican senators. Henry Kissinger, a controversial diplomat, to put it mildly. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Then there's the American industrialists who have been associated, such as Mark Benioff, chief executive officer and co-founder of Salesforce, a multi-billion dollar cloud computing company. Larry Fink from BlackRock, Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan Chase, Michael Dell, Dell Technologies. <laughs> George right here. <laughs> Maker of slightly crap laptops. <laughs> and that is only the Americans. A similarly expansive trend occurs in other nations. Take the UK, for example. Just from its elite establishment, there's been Rishi Shunak, current Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, Labour leader, Boris Johnson, former Conservative PM, Theresa May, former Conservative PM, David Cameron, former Conservative PM, Gordon Brown, former Labour PM, King Charles III! God damn, the king wins! Holy sh I couldn't find any evidence for John Major having any WF association, so in the UK, it would appear that the WF gained traction in the mid to late 90s with the coming of Tony Blair. Probably got invited by George Bush, didn't he? A similar pattern exists across most of the Western world and much of the wider world. The only nations I could find that didn't have politicians turn up for Davos for certain was North Korea, which cut ties in 1998 and had its invitation rescinded in 2016 in response to nuclear testing, and Russia, which was disinvited in 2022 following its invasion of Ukraine. Note, there may be more, but I couldn't find any others for certain, and note further, it isn't necessarily a case of Western hegemony deems you naughty f off, as Iranian Foreign Minister Hussein Amir Abdurrahman, my lord, that's a long surname, attended Davos this year, as did Li Qiang, Premier of the State Council of China. Yeah, it'd be a bit weird if they didn't invite, like, the other guys. <laughs> <laughs> like a bit of a one-sided discussion. And now, just to prove how expansive WF Association is, it's not just the Western world, but the world more generally, both from the political and industrial... Okay, look, there's a lot of people from everywhere else, like, um... Who have I heard of here? Okay, there's someone from Nestle. <laughs> Xi Jinping? Volodymyr Zelensky? Netanyahu? Shinzo Abe? Wait, he's dead. Didn't he just get killed last year? Didn't someone assassinate Shinzo Abe? It's kind of nuts. And at risk of breaking the golden rule of the internet by giving my own political opinion, I think it's fair to say that no matter who you are and what you believe, left, right, up, down, blue tie team, good, red tie team, good, whatever the f 
having such an insane amount of elites concentrated within or adjacent to a single institution is more than fair reason to raise an eyebrow maybe even two especially when you bear in mind that again the list i blasted through was far from comprehensive i feel like if north korea was gonna like use one of its nukes <laughs> Just like nuke the World Economic Forum, and you're literally taking out most of the world's leadership who don't like you. And most of the ones who do. I could literally spend this entire video just listing off elites with WF connections, so ridiculously expansive is the list. As for the next aspect of WF to consider, we already know that it became a social club of sorts for the world's elites, but further to that, let me ask you this. Pretend you're Klaus Schwab. You are a man who, through gathering elites, has built up possibly the world's single most comprehensive Rolodex, and through controlling said social club, also built up the ability to, theoretically at least, exert an insane amount of soft power. So would you give in to the obvious temptation and start pushing for what you thought was good and proper, or would you defer out some lofty sense of democracy? And and instead say to yourself no no not for me i'll just take my millions and meddle not i hope so and also the reality is like this dude while he started it if like there's like five former presidents there or whatever they'll just be like should we just start our own club in like i don't know france or wherever or somewhere else like close to switzerland and be like let's just do world economic forum too and this this schwab guy who's trying to influence us but let's be frank 99 percent of us would choose the latter wouldn't we what really just take my millions medal not i would but i feel people are greedy well klaus certainly chose that option anyway and so as the davos meetings began to grow ever greater he eventually turned his mind to developing that mechanism of soft power which he did with the establishment of 10 so-called centers these are thematic hubs that centralize and streamline the WF's lobbying efforts within their own management hierarchy, or as the WF put it in its usual dialect of hurdy-wordy corporate bollocks speak, quote, The world is confronted with a range of unprecedented challenges, and it's crucial for businesses, governments, and civil society to work together to find common solutions and take decisive actions. Through its centers, the World Economic Forum, oh my god, I'm just falling asleep reading this. It's just, you know when you read something and just like, blah, 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 that's all you hear in your mind? Blah, 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 blah that's what i've got like who gives a they just start to stuff george lists them all i'm not gonna read that because it's boring between all of these the wf has about a thousand business partners and a thousand initiatives although note that some of them will be overlaps i.e initiatives involving more than one center and business partners that sponsor or work with multiple centers and if you happen to suspect that there's a lot of overlap between those centers you're absolutely correct or at least it certainly sounds that way to my smooth brain so knowing all of that then, the WF clearly has some ability to influence politics. That much is clear, but for exactly how much it can exert, well, that's a far more subjective matter. So to try and get an answer, let's bring this chapter to a close and move on to have a look at the WF conspiracy theory and through assessing it, what we can learn about the WEF's power. The Great Reset From the chapter title alone, you can probably guess what this conspiracy is all about. A supposed attempt to re-establish global society with a new set of governing principles. But for us today, wanting as we are to assess the power the WF really has, such a basic understanding of the conspiracy will not serve us well enough. Oh no no, we want to really get to grips with it and what they're really accused of doing. So with that in mind, let's begin our deep dive by turning to that most dependable font of wisdom for all matters conspiratorial. InfoWars, specifically one of their articles written by Michael Snyder back in 2020 titled What is the Great Reset? Snyder isn't an InfoWars regular like Alex Jones, Owen Schroyer, or Paul Joseph Watson, all of whom you may be familiar with if you've consumed any of the platform's content before, even just in passing. I have not and I don't know who they are. I don't want to either. I don't need Infowars in my life. Instead, he is nominally of The Economic Collapse, a small niche blog which is Infowars adjacent, for want of a better description in its ideas. But despite that, this article is a cracking summary of the Infowars position on the Great Reset, and so it'll make a great frame of reference for us. To quote, The internet sure has been buzzing about the Great Reset lately. That term has been trending on Facebook and Twitter, and the New York Times even published an article dismissing it as a conspiracy theory. But such dismissal sparks no joy for Snyder, who, following that, immediately goes on to launch a counter to it, quoting again, But it is definitely no conspiracy theory. I was determined to get to the bottom of this whole thing, and I am going to share the facts that the New York Times either could not find or refuses to share. It turns out that the Great Reset is actually an initiative that was started by the World Economic Forum that is designed to get global stakeholders to cooperate in simultaneously managing the direct consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. The following comes directly from the official website of the 
WEF, quoting within a quote, There is an urgent need for global stakeholders to cooperate in simultaneously managing the direct consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. To improve the state of the world, the World Economic Forum is starting the Great Reset Initiative. Okay, I mean, that... Uh, if you don't know what the Great Reset is, you're just like, okay, so they're working together to, like, do no problems there. From there, he then links to an InfoWars video segment titled, New York Times calls the Great Reset a baseless conspiracy theory, which we won't worry too much about, not just because it has zero likes even on InfoWars' own video platform. Well, I mean, that's going to be their only video platform, right? No one's... Uh, I mean, maybe. What's that right-wing one? Uh, Rumble? Is it Rumble? Is it Rumble? There's another one as well. Um... It's not Slack. <laughs> That's the name of a messaging app. Ah! The the streamers go to. Ah, kick! But also because it takes seven and a half minutes just to make a single point. The New York Times ran a headline declaring that the Great Reset wasn't real, while Time magazine ran a cover exalting its virtue. Caught you red-handed globalist. And to be fair to Snyder, a face value, this does look a bit of a like a bit of a gotcha moment in which the globalists have been caught bare-cheeked with their pants down, giving out conflicting messaging to the proles. Well, it would if it wasn't for the fact that I took the time to track down the New York Times article in question, something that proved surprisingly difficult due to the fact that the Infowars said he links doesn't actually show it in a way that makes it easily identifiable. I wonder why that is. And I can report that it in no way says what he says it does. What it really says is that the conspiratorial aspect of the Great Reset is bollocks, not that it isn't a real WEF initiative. Personally, if I was ghostwriting Snyder's piece, I'd have gone for more of a the globalists are hiding in plain sight, this is all just incrementalism, ready to soften us up for their real intentions type of angle. Not that I want to give InfoWars any tips, although saying that, I am but man at the end of the day, and thus my scruples almost certainly do have a price tag on them. Tell you what, Alex, if you are watching, you spring me from Simon's basement bung eight figures into my account, sort me out a green card, give me a ride home in the InfoWars tank, and you can consider me a full-time Info Warrior. We'll get those goddamn globalists. <laughs> eight figures is a lot, though. That's like 10 mil. I wonder if I'll do InfoWars for 10 mil. No, I don't know. I couldn't. I'd feel too dirty. And I feel like I got enough money. <laughs> InfoWars, man, it's such a piece of sh but I digress. Back to the matter at hand. From there, Snyder goes on to use the WF's own website to explain the Great Reset conspiracy further, saying the following, quoting again, According to the World Economic Forum, the Great Reset is a unique window of opportunity for global leaders to shape the future of global relations, the direction of national economies, the priorities of societies, the nature of business models, and the management of a global commons. As we enter a unique window of opportunity to shape the recovery, this initiative, oh my god, the corporate speak, WEF, it's killing me! Uh, offers insight to help inform all those determining the future state of global relations, the direction of national economies, the priorities of society. Blah, blah, blah. Oh my god, I literally can't read this. But they're just like, let's get together and talk about so we can like make things better. Fine. Done. Just write that. Just write that World Economic Forum. Why do you? It literally feels like it was written by ChatGPT. Wait, so this is Snyder quoting from the WF's own website. Why don't we just quote the WF's own website? I guess to say that he put in the article. Fine. From there, he proceeds to take otherwise valid factual information and just put the most out there spin on it possible, saying the following quote, In other words, the Great Reset is essentially just an updated blueprint for a new world order. No, it's just... That's like saying the, the, the House of Commons is the new world order because politicians are all getting together and deciding... No, it's just people getting together and deciding... Except no, that's not what it said, was it, Snyder? The key word was offer. It didn't say force or coerce, did it? Notable here is an element of dogmatic presupposition too. At no point does he go on to explain how that matches the supposed platform or agenda of the New World Order. It's just presented as if it's a given, as though every single person reading it will already be perfectly aware of exactly what that entails and thus being already predisposed to the idea, and they'll simply nod their heads in agreement upon being presented with the term and mentally connect the dots in a way that seems agreeable to their own biases. Of course, because they're on the InfoWars website. <laughs> <laughs> this was actually quite a clever move on Snyder's part, seeing as how he was publishing on a niche platform like InfoWars. Niche. But to our lay folk, however, it does leave a us scratching our heads and wondering what the f*** he's talking about. Then, with that uh, 
proven, Snyder then turns his guns on Klaus Schwab, quoting again, The man behind the Great Reset is named Klaus Schwab. He is the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, and elsewhere on the official site of the WF there's an article by Schwab entitled, Now is the Time for a Great Reset. He's also very open about the fact that he wants to revamp all aspects of our societies and economies. That means that all aspects of human activity would fall under his plan. But in particular, he very much wants a great reset of capitalism. That definitely sets off alarm bells. When people start talking about dramatic changes to capitalism, usually what they mean is we should move even more in the direction of socialism. According to, well, that is the opposite end of the spectrum, isn't it? Like, moving a little bit of the way towards socialism doesn't mean you're not capitalist. It just means you're mildly... Like, true capitalism would be like no f regulations at all. It would, like, um... Is it anarcho-capitalism that people call that, where it's just like the far extremes? And no one has that. Like, America is super capitalist and all that. But there's still elements of socialism, like the good bits, the nice bits, where it's like, oh, you know, old people aren't getting sick and dying because they got, like, Medicare or whatever. That kind of stuff, where it's like, oh, yeah, no, there's, there's government doing stuff. There's, like, laws. That's good. The quote continues, According to Schwab, there are three main components to the Great Reset. The first involves reforming our economic systems so that they will promote more equitable outcomes. And then, before moving on to the next point, he squeezes in a jab at US Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for some reason, saying the following quote, Unfortunately, I think that he means the exact same thing that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez means when she talks about more equitable outcomes. I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> What does that even mean? What? I can I, I do... I do not understand. That's it. That's all he says on the matter. There's no further expansion that I've cut off. That's literally it. Now, frankly, I have no idea what Ocasio-Cortez did to warrant that jab, and frankly, I don't really care. What I am far more interested in is that use of dogmatic presupposition again. He knows that he is singing to the choir, so to speak, and so he can get away with sloppy and emotional arguments. Again, Incidentally, I did actually ring up her office to try and get her opinion on why she was targeted, but alas, much to my chagrin, I was promptly told to f*** off by an intern, something about commenting on conspiracies being a waste of representatives' time. <laughs> Respected Marshal Kim Jong-un. <laughs> Okay. I would totally have sent me a cute little message, but I digress. He then goes on to pull the exact same trick once again as he moves on to explain what Schwab's plan actually supposedly entails, quoting again. Schwab says that one of the main components of the Great Reset would involve massive government investments in green urban infrastructure and other similar projects. Oh no, green infrastructure? Like, that sounds like a good if that's what they're if that's the conspiracy they're all getting together at davos and talking about how are we going to make more green infrastructure why would you turn this into a negative thing the second component of the great reset agenda would insnet would ensure that investments advanced shared goals such as equality and sustainability wait what's wrong with equality and sustainability aren't these things people want here, the large-scale spending programs that many governments are implementing represent a major opportunity for progress. The European Commission, for one, has unveiled plans for a 750 billion euro, that's 806 billion dollar recovery fund. The US, China, and Japan also have ambitious economic stimulus plans. Rather than using these funds, as well as investments from private entities and pension funds, to fill cracks in the old system, we should use them to create a new one that's more resilient, equitable, and sustainable in the long run. This means, for example, building green urban infrastructure and creating incentives for industries to improve their track record on environmental, social and governance metrics. He then explains the final supposed components of the Great Reset, quoting again, Schwab envisions applying the innovations that we have witnessed during the COVID pandemic as a model for every sector of society. Quote within a quote here, The third and final priority of a Great Reset agenda is to harness the innovations of the Fourth Industrial Revolution to support the public good, especially by addressing health and social challenges. During the COVID-19 crisis, companies, universities, and others have joined forces to develop diagnostics, therapeutics, and possible vaccines, establish testing centers, create mechanisms for tracking infections, and deliver telemedicine. Imagine what would be possible if similar concerted efforts were made in every sector. That's the end of the quote within a quote, and... The article goes on to say, in other words, Schwab thinks that the global response to the COVID pandemic can be a blueprint for governing every area of our lives moving forward. No, that's not what he's saying, Snyder. What he's saying is, look, something happened. We can learn from it and apply those learnings to the future. If you don't do that, if you don't do that sort of thing, you're a f idiot. 
Well, Snyder isn't technically wrong here, but also, yeah, he is in real terms, as he once again intentionally put the worst possible spin on Schwab's words. He doesn't say it outright, but trust it from someone quite well versed in Infowars lore, the image Schneider is trying to convey here is you being locked in your home under the authority of the state monopoly on violence, again, but instead of being for it. Ah, George! What sort of sentence is this? But instead of it being for, you know, the kind of fair and valid reason of an actual global pandemic that killed millions of people, instead it's for the globalist agenda. As these types see it, living in the pot, eating the bugs, owning nothing and being happy, all of that kind of thing. And yes, this could well be what Schwab means, as he doesn't explicitly state it isn't that in the extract, but Snyder completely fails to prove that, and thus frankly leaves himself looking like a bit of a tit to anyone except those long accustomed to Infowars content. He closes the article predicting what the Great Reset's going to look like. Of course, in order for the globalists to get the United States on board with this Great Reset, they will need to get Donald Trump out of the way first, and they think that they are very close to achieving that goal. The globalists envision- wait, didn't he go to Davos? He was there. <laughs> He just goes in there, like he goes into Arabia, he's like, yo, not you, Trump, get out, we're talking about you. The globalists envision a sustainable future in which all forms of human activity are very closely monitored and controlled for the good of the planet. They are entirely convinced that a global system in which all the nations of the world are increasingly integrated is what is best for humanity. Wait, yeah, yeah, but it is. Like, being integrated with other countries mean we're not fighting with them. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't peace good? Who's arguing against peace? But those of us that are resisting the globalists understand that a one-world system will inevitably evolve into a complete and utter global nightmare. Why? Why, what, why is that inevitable? That seems far from inevitable. Globalist publications such as the New York Times will continue to try to convince all of us that plans such as the Great Reset do not even exist, even as globalist organizations such as the World Economic Forum are publicly announcing their plans right out in the open. Well, yeah, but you've completely misinterpreted their plans, Snyder. You're just a bit dumb, Snyder, in my opinion, allegedly. Uh, the quote ends. And so, through Snyder, there we have laid it out bare. The conspiratorial interpretation of the Great Reset. In a nutshell, the loss of your liberties, your wealth, everything that makes your life worth living, all at the behest of a bunch of climate change worshipping globalists who will keep their bourgeois lifestyle as you, the common person, are confined to the pod, eat the bugs, and live out your existence staring through a pair of virtual reality goon goggles. Obviously, that interpretation is utter bollocks, as my tone throughout this chapter thus far is no doubt made rather clear as well as mine, Simon's commentary. Yes, it's absurd. But fortunately, because my name isn't Michael Snyder, I'm not going to say, trust me, bro, and expect you to take my word for it. So instead, let's now move on to discuss what the actual Great Reset is. We already got a little whiff of it through Snyder's carefully curated quotes, of course, but let's now do it properly. The Great Reset is a broad and multifaceted proposal, and key word there, it's a proposal that encompasses a range of initiatives aimed at reshaping the global economy and societal structure in the wake of the COVID pandemic. Pandemic. It was first introduced by both the WEF and then Prince Charles, now King Charles, in June 2020, and aims to capitalize on the crisis as an opportunity to address various systemic issues across economic, environmental, and social dimensions and to foster a more sustainable and resilient future. So far, so straightforward, right? Wait, Prince Charles is really putting this forward? <laughs> I kind of make you remember this actually. But it's like, why do we have to listen to Prince Charles? He's just like the ultimate Nepo baby. The WF's actually filled with important people who got elected and made billions of dollars. And then there's Prince Charles who rolls up and he's just there because his blood's a bit blue. But just so you know, I'm not feeding you all a big old load of bollocks. Here it is straight from the horse's mouth. The very article written to introduce the proposal titled, Now is the time for a great reset. Quoting again, COVID-19 lockdowns may be gradually easing, but anxiety about the world's social and economic prospects is only intensifying. To achieve a better outcome, the world must act jointly and swiftly to revamp all aspects of our societies and economies, from education to social contracts and working conditions. Every country from the United States to China must participate, and every industry from oil and gas to tech must be transformed. In short, we need a great reset of capitalism. That does sound quite ominous, like a great reset of capitalism. I mean, it's like, to what? Have you got, like, capitalism is far from a perfect system. Uh, I think it's a decent, I, I think it's probably a, a, a better system than many of the other options? Is it perfect? No. But what are you going to be resetting it to? How are we going to make it better? And more importantly, how are you going to get everyone on board? Different countries have different interpretations, like European capitalism is really different to American capitalism. But what of those specific dimensions to the Great Reset proposal we just mentioned, the economic, environmental, and social ones? How is it proposed that they should be transformed? 
Fortunately, we already have a grounding in this courtesy of Snyder and is including quotes in this article, albeit ones that he took super out of context, so don't worry too much about the exact word for word white collar gobbledygook the WEF themselves used to discuss it, as I think we've had quite enough of that for now. Instead, I'll explain it to you plain and simple. In terms of economic reforms, the Great Reset advocates for a radical transformation in both fiscal and monetary policies to support a transition to a green economy. This includes redesign the stimulus packages that countries deploy in times of economic crisis to ensure that these measures bolster environmentally sustainable initiatives. Well, that seems quite clever. Like if the government's spending trillions of dollars bailing out, how about you just bail out the companies that are more likely to do good and like, make it green and stuff? That seems to make sense. I'm sure it's way more complicated than that, but that's a prima facie good idea. For example, government financial aid would preferentially support industries that operate within the green economy or are transitioning towards reduced environmental footprints. Central banks might adopt new criteria for qualifying financial support, favoring companies that demonstrate commitments to sustainable practices. The infusion of capital into renewable energy sectors like wind and solar, along with funding for the development of sustainable transportation such as electric buses and trains, cycling infrastructure and pedestrian pathways, would form a double-edged strategy of stimulating economic growth and achieving environmental goals. This sounds like, um, what was that big thing in the Depression? The public, like the big public work projects where the government pumped loads of money into giving people jobs and they built like highways. This sounds like the modern equivalent of that. That's not a bad idea. It's like, don't just do it when no one needs it. Like, and the economy is like trundling along because, well, that's not going to get you elected, is it? But if, every, if there's some sort of major depression going on, then just, dude, this seems like a good plan. <laughs> seems like a really good idea. This approach envisions a future in which corporations are oriented to serve the interests of all their stakeholders, not just their shareholders. Stakeholders in this context being their employees, customers, suppliers, local communities, and the environment, in addition to the shareholders who own a part of the company. An idea the WEF dubs stakeholder capitalism. I stake, that's a complicated thing because a stakeholder can be anyone who's got an interest in a business that's not financial, which isn't capitalism because they don't have a financial interest, like the environment's not reaping profits. As for societal reforms, what the Great Reset calls for is broad revolutionary changes in cultural, educational, and structural domains. Specifically, it calls for increased public and private investment in the arts, which are often sidelined during economic recessions, but are crucial for societal morale and cultural enrichment. I mean, yes, that's a really nice thing to say, but during a depression, you also need economic drivers, and that's not one of them. I'm not sure I agree with that. Like, do I like the arts? Yes, in a weird way. Like, I'm a creator, I make shit. But do I think that I should be getting government funding during a recession? <laughs> no, no, it should go to like people building electronic railways and shit. Demilitarization is another critical component, with the idea that reducing global military spending could redirect substantial resources towards productive and sustainable uses. Again, this is a fantastic idea, brilliant. Except, you've got to get all the countries to agree. You're not even inviting North Korea. Like, you're not even, in, you're not even inviting Russia. Like, and that's, that, that's a big part of the problem. Like, this is a bit stupid sometimes like there's there's bits of this that i think are pretty stupid as well this includes not only direct financial savings but also the potential repurposing of military assets and technologies for civilian use yes am i really like dumb because i'm thinking that this isn't realistic and maybe these super genius people at the wef think that this is really possible but bro the repurposing of military technology is not going to happen if that military technology isn't developed in the first place. And the reason that military technology is developed is because they've got loads of money from the military industrial complex and taxpayer money going into it. It's like, how do you think that works? If there's no military, they're not going to develop those technologies, so those technologies are not going to be put into the civilian sector. Like, what? Sustainable architecture is a focal point too, advocating for the adoption of green building practices that minimize energy consumption and reduce waste. Yeah, that's, an, uh, that's a good idea. Additionally, the push for technology-driven education would aim to adapt schooling systems to the demands of a future marked by rapid technological advancements. So-called STEAM education, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, would be a particular emphasis within this technology driven education system, creating a do-it-all workforce that would be, for want of a better term, past, present, and future-proof. When it comes to the environmental sustainability aspect, which itself strays into the other areas, as you have seen, it is about one thing and one thing alone. 
climate change, more specifically, the mitigation of it. Naturally, this would involve a shift away from fossil fuel energy production, i.e. coal and gas, in favor of solar, wind, and nuclear production. But a transition wouldn't come cheap, and so the WEF propo proposes government incentives such as subsidies or tax breaks to encourage widespread adoption. Great. I think this is fine. I was just looking into getting solar panels for my house because the government paid for like half of it. Uh, that's a pretty good deal. You just put them on your roof and then the government like, I, I guess it comes off your taxes or whatever, but they pay for like half of that. Really expensive. And just to be clear, that isn't just taxman to taxpayer incentives either, as the WEF would also like to see richer governments help out poorer governments with adopting those technologies too, either through direct aid payments, favorable tariff rates, or through technological co co cooperation pro bono i mean that's an interesting one right because the rich countries have got to be like yeah well why why and my feeling there is like a lot of the countries that are rich today got there and they did a sh load of damage to the environment getting there and now there's like not china china's like definitely you know but let's use china as an example they are expected to be all environmentally friendly and sh while their economy's growing massively and it's like yo when the like britain and during the industrial revolution and all that and the us they, we didn't give a about the environment and now we expect china to and it's like well okay china's a bad example because they're so rich but like india or something and we expect them to care about the environment when they just want to focus on their economy growing and their country getting rich which is what we did so we should have like if we want them to be green then we've got some responsibility to help them out with that right i should not be so political i don't know enough about this stuff to really comment it's just like the prima facie stuff moreover expanding green public transportation systems in cities is also on the agenda in a method which can be surmised as cars bad shared metal tubes and people powered machines good and that's literally it in a nutshell it's the idea that as we all run about and do economic stuff we should be a bit nicer to both each other and the planet while doing it so it doesn't sound too bad right or does it i mean there's bits of it that sounds a bit like dreamy and like unrealistic but there's plenty of stuff that i like it because whilst it might sound like it's all rainbows and sunshine at face value there's a lot of thinkers and i mean proper ones not infowars contributors who find what the great reset proposes to be very objectionable so now let's have a look at what they say and see for ourselves and see if the bright and shining horizon that the great reset proposes might be in fact blinding us to a very dark cloud that looms above it one such detractor is harris gleckman senior fellow at the center for governance and sustainability at the university of Massachusetts. It is his belief that the Great Reset would undermine democratic processes by removing power from elected officials and their apparatuses and handling apparatuses. I feel like it should be apparati or something. Apparatuses. It's a weird word. And handing it over to corporations which are both unelected and much harder to hold accountable. And they have a really different drive, like people probably get in. <laughs> should I say it? People probably get into politics because they want to, like, do sh like and change things and maybe make things better whereas which i feel is a stupid thing because maybe they just want to get into it for power but corporations just care about profits it's all they do it's like their thing think of it like this a politician enacts a nutty policy you dislike so what do you do you march yourself over to their voting booth once the time comes slap a big tick by someone else's name and if enough other people agree with you the aforementioned irksome politician will be booted from his post and has to make it in the real world just like you now imagine it's a corporation you dislike which is doing something you dislike what can you do well you can boycott them right well if you don't buy their products absolutely f all. but if you do buy them well you can boycott them can't you which would be great except for the fact that even if everyone agrees with you corporations are enormous entities with astronomical capital reserves and so they are well insulated against backlash oh is this the one where bud light wait what did they do did they like sponsor someone who was trans or something and then like a whole bunch of conservative people were like oh don't lie about that bud lights oh this is the kid rock thing right and he had like a gun and he was like shooting bud light because he's like trans people or some shit like that allegedly to see this in action, think of the still ongoing Bud Light boycott, which began in 2023 when the company did a promotion with actress and TikTok personality Dylan Mulvaney, who happens to be a transgender woman. This saw a big kickoff from certain, and I stress, certain, not all, groups of the American right, in addition to anti trans groups who announced a boycott in response. This indeed did have a big impact at face value, as it caused sales to drop by as much as 26% at times. Are there really, is it really a quarter of people who drink, <laughs> drink Bud Light? 
are so upset by the idea of them sponsoring someone who's trans that they won't drink Bud Light anymore. This just seems insane. Who gives a... <laughs> do you, why do you care so much? Homophobic. Transphobic. It even saw Bud Light pulled from many bars and even caused some retailers to quite literally give the stuff away for free. Sounds like quite the impact, doesn't it? And yet, despite this seemingly substantial impact, it has actually achieved all in real terms bud light is owned by anheuser-busch a giant brewing conglomerate that controls near as damn it half of the entire american booze market and brings in give or take 15 billion dollars every year and with bud light being just one of their brands sure their stock value has gone down a tiny bit and i mean a tiny bit but what has actually changed in the real world these people are probably like i was buying that bud light and now i just drink regular bud <laughs> like aos hey, that comes from the same place it's like i don't care i just don't like that bud what bud light do i now i don't like that bud light like i don't like those trans men homophobic transphobic they're still making billions all but two of their executives are still living it up in caligula style luxury and those two have only been put on a leave of absence supposedly to make a reappearance when the dust has settled yeah you can't fire people because they did an advert with someone who's trans that's a really bad look anheuser-busch it didn't even stop bud light from supporting lgbt plus rights in its marketing as it went on to sponsor both toronto and cincinnati pride after the start of the boycott good for you bud and that i mean does make your beer any better unfortunately but uh good for you and that gleckman's argument goes on is the exact problem when the modern market is dominated by these giant conglomerates that own basically everything the ability of the consumer to make a very real impact is near nil and thus one should be very worried about greater power being handed over to them oh and just to really be clear because it appears to be something of a landmine most easily stepped on online i want to stress that i have no opinion on the bud light by bud light boycott at all personally as a man who is flatly banned from america for the foreseeable future of having visited too many naughty countries the amount of i have to give about american internal issues is sub nil i mean yeah but i also i don't know like i think people should be be allowed like i don't give a shit. like if you feel more like a woman than a dude go be a woman i don't give a it doesn't affect me like why do we care <laughs> just let the be i cited it simply as a point of reference so we could see gleckman's ideas in action and that is all for what it's worth though if i were to research into the actual controversy itself and not just its economic consequences well let's just say that as a man who's partial to a bit of willy from time to time for a tr it's okay i don't suspect that i'd be overly behind a boycott if in if it did indeed turn out to be some people seeing some rainbows on their tinny and subsequently and subsequently spewing it up into their mouths oh my god what the <laughs> that was a hell of a sentence george like i said though i haven't looked into it at that angle and so i'm withholding giving an opinion but i digress let's get back to it another critic is alex nichols a professor of social entrepreneurship at the university of oxford he raises concerns similar to harris glackman about the great reset and its promotion of stakeholder capitalism as a means to improve society i feel like stakeholder capitalism i mentioned it earlier it doesn't feel like something that is real like that doesn't seem like something that could be possible specifically he critiques the depth of corporate behavior changes under this model arguing that these changes are often only superficial and do not fundamentally alter how companies are held accountable for their impacts in other words since the function of a corporation is in nichols's opinion to make money and only to make money when a corporation wades into social issues they will only do it if it perceives that by signaling their virtue they'll drive future profits meaning that their heart is rarely ever truly in on the matter and thus efforts to deliver change will be half-assed yeah i think that's definitely true for public traded companies like very large companies i think small companies uh absolutely can be conscious uh socially conscious and actually be driven that way because there's usually like one person at the helm who's like yes let's do this i i believe in this whereas a giant company's got like a board and directors and a chairman and shareholders and they like money Further this, the corporate efforts to do good by Nichols's critique will also be ineffectual because they will invariably be done on the cheap since, after all, the company's main motivation will always be profits. Uh, to be fair, I don't care if they're done on the cheap. I'm just like, as long as something's being done, like, if the optics of it are better for a company and that means they give money to charity, fine. Like, the, the overall outcome is good. Money is going to charity. 
Compare this to state-led efforts, which are argued to be better as they can be funded by just letting corporations do what they do best, taxing what they yield, and then using that cash to do it properly in a non-profit-driven environment in which the end result is all that matters, or so the idea goes anyway. Similar critiques also come from Mariana Muscato, a professor in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at University College London, and Ronald Labont, professor of Globalization and Health Equity at the University of Ottawa. She criticizes the Great Reset for its reliance on private partnerships and market forces, which she believes are insufficient without robust government intervention and regulation. She also argues that such an approach is unlikely to lead to equitable social and environmental outcomes, emphasizing the need for a more proactive governmental role in shaping markets to ensure they serve broader societal goals effectively. Simply enough, once again, we can't trust corporations to do the right thing. Uh, no, don't be trusting corporations. Always just remember that corporations, large corporations, are driven by their bottom line. Like, I run a small company, and I feel like I'll make decisions that I'm ethically comfortable with, and therefore that's what my company's ethical decisions are. But if I was running like a 10,000-person company, and we had like shareholders and shit, I'd be like, well, I've just got to make money because that's what the shareholders want, and my share price goes up, and that's good for... I don't know, I guess you just become a bit lost in the weeds, don't you? But, like... You can't trust large companies to do the right thing. They're driven by profits. Always just remember that and assess their behavior based on that assumption. This is also basically what Lebont argues, as he expresses concerns that a shift to stakeholder capitalism could undermine public government governance and control. He warns that this model could grant disproportionate power to corporations, potentially at the expense of democratic institutions and public accountability. As a solution to this, he stresses the importance of maintaining strong governmental oversight to ensure that corporate actions are aligned with public interest and do not override democratic processes. As for people who support the Great Reset, that includes people such as Christine Lagarde, president of the European Central Bank, who is also a big-time affiliate supporter and enjoyer of the WEF more generally. On the matter, she believes that the Great Reset represents a particularly tantalizing prospect for the unique scope of the opportunities it presents, and on her WEF podcast appearances, yes, that's a thing, and no, I don't recommend listening to it because it's dull as fuck, she explains at great length how she believes that by making environmental sustainability a core component of economic recovery plans, global economies can be reborn with renewed vigor, both more resilient and inclusive in the long term. Okay, fine. So it's like, okay, regenerate your economy with green planning. Boom. Don't need to listen to that podcast. Similarly, Nepo baby King Charles III, who as we know played a significant role both in, in both floating and popularizing the concept of the Great Reset before he donned the UK's big shiny hat, speaks often of the opportunity to reimagine, rebalance, and invigorate global systems through sustainable practices. So clearly, he's still flying the Great Reset flag. So then, now that we maybe we should reset the country and like actually have a republic instead of a monarchy, Charles. <laughs> That's what the Great Reset should be, Charlie. <laughs> so then, now that we know all about the Great Reset, a new question emerges. Has any of it actually turned into real-world policy? In short, yes, it has. In the EU, for example, a lot of its recent policy aligns with the Great Reset. I mean, it's a very broad concept, though. It's like government money into green. Okay. Uh, learning from the COVID pandemic. Okay, like this day, it's very broad, and to say that some of it's been implemented is like that that doesn't necessarily mean very much for example one of its responses to the covid 19 pandemic was the 648 billion euro next generation eu policy which first appeared in 2022 holy 648 billion euro jesus in my mind that was million for a second i was like oh it's a relatively small project but 648 billion is absurdly huge it's quote a groundbreaking temporary recovery instrument to support Europe's economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic and build a greener, more digital, and resilient future. Has that actually done anything? I've never heard of this 650 billion euro project. And did, I mean, of course there were some economic impacts of COVID, but it wasn't that bad, was it? In fact, for me, it was quite good because people were just staying in and watching more YouTube. <laughs> it's like, yes, COVID, yes! I mean, other than all the deaths. So, uh, yeah. As for what that actually means, a good example to demonstrate is the Recovery and Resilience Facility the Next Generation EU created, which supports member states in implementing comprehensive reforms and investment initiatives that focus on green energy transition and the digitization of the workforce. What is digitization of the workforce? Is that just getting more people to work on computers or what? But consider further, great reset -y policies aren't exactly new in the EU and didn't just suddenly appear with the announcement of the WEF 
F's initiative. Take Clean Sky 2, for example, which was launched in 2014 with a budget of 4 billion euros and it aims to decarbonize air travel and Shift to Rail, which also launched in 2014 and with a budget of 920 million euros, aims to decarbonize rail travel and promote it as an eco friendlier alternative to air travel, particularly on short haul routes. Yeah, the problem there is like rail still f slow as f like you get on a train, it's like even going to from like south of England to the north of England or to Scotland, it's like you could fly there in like an hour or 45 minutes maybe, or you could spend your whole f day on a train. <laughs> like, which would you rather? Maybe the train could be quite relaxing, but let's assume people are traveling for business, they just want to be there. Both of these projects feature a large degree of private public sector co cooperation, and so, given that and what we just heard, it's fair to say they sound pretty great resetty, and yet they predate it. How curious. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. It's all very broad. And that leads us to the final question that we really tie that will really tie this chapter's big dilemma up. Did the Great Reset spawn from the minds of WF's leadership or its members? If it's the former, well, New World Order confirmed as far as I'm concerned, and if it's the latter, then it would appear as though the WF is but a boat being carried downstream on a current that it cannot control. And that unfortunately just isn't something I'm able to answer. Uh honestly, I just think it's the the latter. <laughs> it seems like it's the latter. It's like, okay, so they're pursuing green policies. WF comes along and he's like, great reset. How about we pursue green policies? And everyone's like, yeah, bro, we know. <laughs> That's it. I control F'd my way through at least two dozen different books, mostly the memoirs of Davos attendees and some wider histories of Davos itself, desperate to pick up on some kind of timeline of when these ideas first emerged and from whom, but alas, such details simply weren't forthcoming. And so, I am saddened to believe that this crucial detail has been lost to time amidst the halls of Davos. But while I am unable to give you an answer with, my, with any certainty, what I can do is make a reasonable assumption. Given the fact that we have seen that the WEF does indeed hold some degree of soft political power, coupled with the fact that independent policy making clearly still happens to some degree, it's likely a bit of both. Some details of it were likely cooked up in the WEF and distributed among world elites via Davos and the centers. Similarly, other details of it were cooked up in more localized political apparatuses the world over and then injected into the Great Reset Plan in the exact same ways, just from the other direction. Alright, so basically, with regard to the Great Reset, it just seems like the WF is a really big think tank. It's a bunch of smart and rich and powerful people who get together and they're like, oh yeah, we like that idea. We'll give that a green light. Maybe we should do that more. It's a think tank. It's not some sort of Illuminati sh And that, by my reckoning, is pretty much not just an explanation of the Great Reset, but of the WEF more widely, if we take a few steps back to expand our view a bit. It's less that it's a Machiavellian apparatus that pulls the globe's puppet strings while Dr. Evil himself sits at the head again, that image of him in the suit. He's like, he looks like a villain. And more that it is just one of many arms of the elite's global octopus, say hypothetically if Alex Jones' wet dream were to come true tomorrow and someone was to drop a big old nuke on the WEF headquarters, sure the global elite might have lost their clubhouse as it were and a handful of their most trusted compatriots, but everyone else is still going to be thinking the exact same things, enacting the exact same policies, and taking the world in an exact same direction. The WEF, while certainly a big part of all that decision making, is by no means a keystone, at least with how I see it. Please feel free to disagree. And now, before we use up that conclusion as a springboard to start wrapping this show up, let's take a quick little diversion and throw a spanner in the works to see if it affects where you are in your thinking thus far. A clear-cut example of a time that the WEF was responsible, or at least involved with something very, very bad indeed. Okay, look, because so far, I'm pretty happy to say like the whole WEF Great Reset thing is like there's no conspiracy there. It's just a think tank thinking about. That's it. That's it. Leave it alone. The Davos Pact. I actually spent a lot of time on this chapter as compared to the others, writing and subsequently binning at least half a dozen drafts before committing to the one you're currently witness to. Way more than a man who's paid by the world should ever delete. But why did I do this? Was it because of atrocious grammar or structuring, perhaps? No, not at all. This isn't an early George script, folks, in which the absolute belting, if I do say so myself, final product holds no trace of the absolute spew of verbal vomit that was the initial draft, after having it been extensively polished and reworked by my Myself, following a polite but much warranted application of Simon size 10s up my rear. I do wear size 10 shoes. Well, nine and a half. It's like some brands nine, some brands ten. 
There you go. If not that, then, was my repeated redrafting the result of a complete absence of sources, which would have just led to the penning of a shallow, empty, and ultimately vacuous chapter, which made a hell of a lot of noise but conveyed absolutely nothing of worth to you, our much loved audience? It reminds me of that article by that Snyder bloke back in the one chapter ago, two chapters ago. Again, absolutely not. If there is one thing you can't accuse the WEF of, it is doing things in the shadows. Everything they do, for better or worse, they scream loud and proud from the rooftops and provide an extensive paper trail of many varying sources to back it all up. Was it then the fact that I struggled to come to terms with the reality that they were actually involved in some genuinely horrific shit, and that struggle caused me to have something of a mental spiral because I would have to abandon my normal fence-sitting Mr. Beige persona and actually pick a side, one that I feared could see me labelled as an Alex Jonesian conspiracy theorist, and yes, it is that one. But alas, the facts are the facts at the end of the day, and thus I am forced to call the WEF out here because there's no other angles or perspectives to the truth missile that I'm about to launch right through your speakers. So then, given that rather hyped lead-in, you're all probably wondering what exactly it is I'm talking about. Well, that would be the fact that the WEF was complicit in destroying Russian democracy in the 90s and ultimately started a butterfly effect of events that led to the rise of Vladimir Putin and all the horrible stuff that occurred in Russia and its neighboring countries as a result, all of the wars all of the repression, all of the mysterious yet conveniently timed deaths of political dissidents, well, the WEF had a hand in it all. I am super curious how. And even if they did, it's like butterfly effect, right? They didn't see the outcomes. It's like, I'm sure one time I braked on our motorway and then like someone breaks behind me and 700 cars back someone breaked and slammed into the barrier or like something like that. You, it's not the fault of the person who braked. The story begins back in the mid-90s, a time when Russia, to be blunt, was absolutely f***ed. Living standards had absolutely collapsed since the Soviet period, with housing being more expensive, wages being down, and economic growth being all but non-existent. With the dividends of what little growth there was all being scurried away into the pockets of the oligarchs, hyper-wealthy Russians who built their wealth by using their senior positions in the collapsing Soviet state, be it in industry, the military, or politics, to deceive, cheat, and steal their way to controlling formerly state-owned enterprises which were privatized en masse when the Union collapsed. Naturally, the Russian people weren't exactly chuffed with this state of affairs. They hadn't even wanted the USSR to dissolve, having returned a 77.85% result in favor of preserving but reforming the country in a 1991 referendum on the matter, and now they place the blame for it all firmly on the shoulders of incumbent President Boris Yeltsin, a man who not just oversaw the transition of the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic into the barely functional Russian Federation, but proactively agitated for it in his former role as President of Soviet Russia. But they didn't give up hope, because there was a man that they hoped would fix the story se sorry state of things. Gennady Yuganov, the General Secretary of the Russian Communist Party, which was going from strength to strength at the time, having come out of the 1995 legislative election with a thumping great majority in the Duma. Seemingly, according to many contemporary analysts at least, they also appeared poised to do the same in the upcoming 1996 presidential election. Naturally, this didn't spark joy among the oligarchs, who were blind with rage at the prospect of Zuganov taking the presidency. The man was a nutter, they reasoned. Just have a look at his manifesto, chock full of absurd and harebrained promises such as introducing progressive taxation to make the rich pay their fair share, and exempting the lowest earners from paying taxes outright, taking drastic measures to suppress corruption, turning certain key industries to state ownership and reprivatizing some of lesser importance to make sure their ownership was spread amongst the people, as was originally intended during the Soviet collapse. I mean, these are all ideas that would have been really, really good. And facilitating favorable market conditions so that true competition could develop within the domestic market across all sectors. What a novel idea. Can you imagine such a state of things, ladies and gents? If such a platform were enacted, the oligarchs might actually have to delay construction of their mega mansion's latest wing or surrender a Ferrari or two for the common good of their countrymen. It's truly horrific stuff. Beset by disgust at such a prospect, three oligarchs and WF affiliates met up at Davos in 1996 and began planning for how they could leverage their vast assets to prevent that crazy and extremist agenda from ever being implemented in what would become known as the Davos Pact. They were Mikhail Khodorkovsky, 
Kaspersky, who stole ownership of Russia's oil industry and its accompanying apparatus, Vladimir Gosinsky, who stole ownership of much of Russia's media, and Boris Berezovsky, who stole ownership of much of Russia's automotive industry and the media that Gosinsky didn't manage to get his hands on. You could probably guess their plan from just how I described them. The ones that owned media outlets outright, Gosinsky and Berezovsky, simply instructed them to begin churning out hit pieces on Zuganov, an unrelenting tide of negativity whenever he was discussed, be it factual or fabricated. Anything and everything, so long as it was stuck after being thrown, and for Kodoskovsky, who was not far-sighted enough to have stolen a broadcasting company or two, he would pump ungodly amounts of cash into funding hit ads on the other channels that the two didn't own, or just outright paying them to alter their perspectives in the lead-up to the election. And of course, in addition to ass attacking Zuganov relentlessly, they would also make sure to extensively report on Yeltsin as if the sun itself shined out of his arse. After all, the people needed to be told who to vote for after being told who they weren't allowed to vote for, lest someone not in their pockets fluke into power. This is f***ing corrupt. <laughs> To say this worked a treat would be quite the understatement. Instead, it would be far better to say that it worked perfectly. In early 1996, Yeltsin's approval rating barely registered as a distant blip on the radar, with most polling showing him having 8% approval, which oh, would have placed him fifth in the running, while Zuganov polled at 21%, making him the leading candidate by a country mile. So apparently certain was Zuganov's coming victory that when he ironically attended Davos in February 1996, he was treated by many in attendance as if it already won the election. But then the smear campaign began. All of Russia's leading TV channels, Russia One, Channel One in Russia, and NTV, came out guns blazing in support of Yeltsin, as did print media, with the Rossiskaya Gazeta, Izvestia, and Commissant newspapers, to name just a few, all towing the line. Estimates by the European Institute for Media found that Yeltsin received 53% of all media coverage during the campaign, while Zuganov received only 18% and other candidates, well, the media pretended they didn't exist. It was posited as a two-horse race. And you don't want the mad communist to win, do you? No, you want business as usual because Russia was doing oh so well. Sarcasm, everybody. As a result, when the final votes were counted, Yeltsin won just, coming in with 35.79% of the vote compared to Zuganov's 32.49%. All of that money, all of that smear, all of that effort, and he could barely just sneak over the line. Sadly, however, while we may rightly take away a certain sense of vindication from this whisker-thick result, victory is binary in politics, and so it mattered not to Yeltsin and the economic pirates who were behind him. A win was a win, and so their man remained in office, and they were allowed to continue plundering Russia and her people to their heart's content. What's this got to do with Davos, though? When's Davos coming into this? Where's my conspiracy? But wait, it gets worse, because Gazinsky, Berezovsky, and Kodoskovsky now stood poised as the kingmakers of Russian politics, it being blatantly apparent all within the halls of power that it was them, not the people, who held the most power to decide who assumed the reins of power. And so, when 1999 came along, when Yeltsin had fucked up so much that even his plutocratic paymasters couldn't keep him safe, following such disasters as an increasingly deteriorating economy, public sector workers going months without receiving their salary, a literal mafia shadow government that had assumed control of large swaths of the country, and out-of-control terrorist attacks in the heartland, he had to step down. And who got to choose his replacement, a certain Mr. Putin? Well, you guessed it, it was Gazinsky, Berezovsky, and Kodovsky, meaning that the blame for everything that had happened subsequently lands on their shoulders. But let's bring it back to the WEF now, because no doubt many are wondering why I incriminated it, when, as I have told the story thus far, it sounds much like more like Davos was just coincidentally the place that they all happened to meet up and scheme, not necessarily something that the WEF was proactively complicit in. So where do I get the gall, the, the bare face of it, to stand before you now and blame the WEF, at least in part, for everything we've discussed in this chapter? Well, that'd be easy because they didn't just facilitate it through fluke of circumstance, rather they proactively encouraged it, participated in it, and celebrated it after the fact. Here it is, straight from the horse's mouth, specifically their own book, The World Economic Forum, The First 40 Years, 1971-2010, to quoting, The members of the Russian delegation, and particularly the business leaders, became deeply concerned about the popularity of Zuganov and the likelihood of a victory of the Communist Party. They decided to take action and throw their financial weight behind Yeltsin's campaign. The unwritten collective pledge became known as the Davos Pact. 
After their return to Moscow, the so-called oligarchs requested a meeting with President Yeltsin to discuss campaign strategies. In his memoirs, Yeltsin later confirmed the meeting and quoted the oligarchs as saying, What is going on in your campaign headquarters and in your entourage means almost certain failure. The communists will hang us from the lampposts. If we don't turn this situation around drastically in a month, it will be too late. And here's some more from another WEF publication, The World Economic Forum, a partner in shaping history 1971 to 2020, quoting again, In July 1996, Boris Yeltsin was re-elected by a wide margin. To an extent, Russia's political future may have been decided in the corridors of the annual meeting 1996 in Davos. Having seen all of that, I think it's safe to say that there's no two ways about it. The WEF doesn't exactly come out of that whole fiasco smelling of roses. No, but... This just, again, it just feels like they're kind of scheming, and the W is just having to write it down. <laughs> but as for the exact extent of how bad it looks, that for me hinges on the question that you must answer for yourselves. How much can we blame the WEF for the scheming that happens within its walls? I don't think very much, because these dudes, they're either going to do it at the WEF, or they're going to meet up at one of their mansions, and like, smoke some cigars, and drink some vodka, and decide there. It doesn't matter where it happened, it was going to happen. Had the meddling in Russian democracy been the result of one of their initiatives and not just celebrated after the fact, sure, I think we'd all pretty much be unanimous in decrying them for it. But when it seemingly was done by meeting attendees and Davos only happened to be where they'd all meet up, met up to plot it out, mm, it's a pretty grey area. But ultimately, I'm not interested in pinning you down and waterboarding you with my take. I'm far more interested in you using what I've written as a springboard to come to your own conclusions. Yeah, my conclusion is I don't blame the WF for this. Uh, the Great Reset thing was nonsense. It's just a big brain, big money conference where rich people go to talk about and maybe make some changes. Maybe not. Probably not. It's just a think tank. And now that we've reached the end of today's show, we've seen a full and comprehensive explanation of what the WEF actually is, a dissection of its key policies and conspiracies, and depending on your perspective, we've also seen a clear-cut example of the fact that no holds barred, it can clearly be used to do some pretty dark all that is left to do now is to mush all of that together and refine the resulting gunge into a fully fleshed out and formed opinion, and we can bring the show to a close. We already saw my takeaway at the close of chapter 2, however, so instead, to finish us off, let me turn it on to our most illustrious host, Simon, and ask what he reckons. Well, I've, I just laid it out. I've already laid it out. I've laid it out as we've gone along, George, to be honest. And now everyone knows my opinion. And that's the end of the show. Thanks for being here.